Okay, here we go. We're here we're talking about beyond STEMI, diagnose acute coronary occlusion myocardial infarction or OMI with the ECG. And the speakers today are me, Steve Smith, Pendle Myers, and, Ro and Dr. Robert Herman. And we have to go through some disclosures. Uh, I, uh, especially powerful medical is a major disclosure for all of us. And there are a few others for me and for Pendle. And so we're going to start with a case. This is a 60-year-old who had sudden epigastric pain radiating to his chest. And you can see here, there's a big symmetric T wave here. There's some old Q waves here, old infarction he had. But now there's a big T wave here that just is not normal. And neither is that symmetric T wave that has a lot of area under the curve. But that was not seen. This was sent to me later with no information. I just said acute LED occlusion with low certainty. But they didn't see it. And they just got a troponin. The first one was below the upper reference limit. And then the troponins rose over time and they activated the cath lab at six hours, at which time there was 100% LED occlusion. And the peak troponin was greater than 25,000, a very large myocardial infarction. The patient's convalescent ejection fraction was 35% and he had new heart failure. What do you think the diagnosis was? NSTEMI, what a worthless diagnosis. You lose half your heart and all you get is a diagnosis of NSTEMI. Let's change that. So let's look at the timeline of OMI-NOMI for a moment here. I wrote this book, The ECG and Acute MI, in 2002, where I tried to teach people about acute coronary occlusion and its mimics. And then I started this blog, Dr. Smith's ECG blog, in 2008, uh, 15 years ago now. And then I started giving talks called Non-STEMI That Need the Cath Lab Now. In 2012, I had a couple of major publications. One was the derivation of the Smith Modified Scarbosa Criteria for left bum branch block. And then a derivation and validation of my formula for differentiating normal ST elevation in V2 to V4 from ST elevation due to acute LED occlusion. And that formula is extremely accurate. Also in 2012, Pendle Myers got in contact with me. He'd been reading my blog for four years as an undergraduate before medical school. And I could tell already that he was an ECG savant. That year he started medical school and we started doing research together and we published the validation of the Smith modified Scarabossa criteria together. In 2014, I just started giving the talk called the false STEMI non-STEMI dichotomy. It's a worthless dichotomy. And in 2018, Pendle and I decided we need to rename the myocardial infarction paradigm, acute coronary occlusion myocardial infarction or ACOMI. But this seemed a little bit unwieldy. So we added, did a Twitter poll. Should we call it ACOMI or OMI? And the Twitter poll overwhelmingly chose OMI, occlusion myocardial infarction versus non-occlusion myocardial infarction, OMI, NOMI. And so in 2018, we published the OMI Manifesto online. And here is Martin Luther putting an EKG with hyperacute T waves, see those T waves, hyperacute T waves on the cathedral door. And I started giving a talk called, let's replace the STEMI non-STEMI paradigm with the occlusion MI, OMI versus non-OMI, NOMI paradigm. And I gave the keynote Rylant lecture at the 2021 annual meeting of the International Society of Electrocardiology and uh, started to more widely introduce this to the cardiology community that way. Let's go back in history. ST elevation is a supposed surrogate for acute coronary occlusion, but this is just conventional wisdom and dogma. Where does the data come from? It comes from the FTT meta-analysis published in Lancet in 1994. There were nine studies that enrolled at least 1,000 patients in the 1980s, which were placebo-controlled thromboletic trials that totaled 58,000 patients. They were enrolled for suspected MI. Only four out of nine required any ST elevation, and it was very poorly defined. Five out of nine trials had no ECG findings required for enrollment. No trial specified the method of ST measurement. 38% had greater than six hours of chest discomfort at the time of treatment, at which time there was very little salvageable myocardium. They used streptokinase in seven out of nine trials. We know that doesn't work very well. The results, if ST elevation was present, the mortality was lower. If ST depression was present, the mortality was higher. I, say, I should say lower for the treatment group. And if left bone branch block was present, mortality was lower for the treatment group than for the placebo group. So the meta-analysis conclusion was ST elevation is the best way to decide on reperfusion therapy. But as you can see from the data, this is only true if your ECG interpretation is crude, you're treating with streptokinase, and your treatment is delayed. The ST elevation criteria in use today in the fourth universal definition of MI were developed by Peter McFarland in two th published in 2004. This was data from the 1980s, 1,220 patients who had 248 myocardial infarction diagnosed by CKMB, not by angiography, not by troponin, not an angiographic study. He looked at two consecutive leads with ST elevation and found that 
The best cutoff was one millimeter in all leads, except for V2 and V3, measured at the J point relative to the PQ junction, that is the QRS onset. And in V2 and V3, there were different numbers. In women, 1.5 millimeters. In men over age 40, two millimeters. In men under age 40, 2.5 millimeters. This was only 46% sensitive by CKMB. And if you use troponin, it would be much less sensitive than that. It was 98% specific by myocardial infarction by CKMB. But we need to consider lots of other ECG findings, less obvious ST elevation. ST depression, its location, number of leads, rapid treatment, hyperacute T waves, STT morphology, the entire QRS, including terminal QRS distortion and associated Q waves, proportionality, the ratios of STT to QRS amplitudes, in left corner branch block and paste rhythm, in left corner branch block, thrombolytics were better than placebo. But which ones can we narrow it down to which are occluded and which are not? And how about pseudostemy patterns, all the mimics that get the cath lab activated when they're not an OMI at all? So paradigms, these are cognitive frameworks which influence us. The name STEMI leads to cognitive bias, but reframing is necessary. STEMI makes you think that ST segments are all that matter. What really matters? Acute coronary occlusion without collateral circulation, where myocardium is at imminent risk of irreversible infarction, and if recognized early, myocardium remains viable and salvageable with reperfusion. This leads to the STEMI non STEMI paradigm. No, the STEMI non STEMI paradigm leads to the no false negative paradox. What is that? Well, if the ECG meets ST elevation criteria and the angiogram shows acute coronary occlusion, it's a true positive. If there's no angiographic evidence of occlusion, it's a false positive. If the ECG does not meet ST elevation criteria and there is no evidence of occlusion, it's a true negative. But if there's absence of ST elevation and there is acute coronary occlusion, it is a non-STEMI. It's not a STEMI. And therefore, it's not a STEMI because there's no ST elevation. You can't have a false negative. No false negative. The test is the definition. In what other disease is the test the definition of the pathology? Think about appendicitis. We don't call appendicitis a high white count abdominal pain, right? Because white count does not accurately diagnose it. We diagnose appendicitis pathologically. What's going on in the appendix? Well, let's diagnose myocardial infarction by what's going on in the artery and call it ominomi. The state of the artery, occlusion or not, is the definition. This no false negative paradox plays itself out in all of the data in STEMI. If you try to find the, the false negative EKGs for STEMI, you can't because you look at STEMI databases and the STEMI databases only include patients who have ST elevation on their EKG. They don't include patients who have OMI without ST elevation. So in 2017, Kahn published this article, Impact of Total Occlusion of Culprit Artery in Acute NSTEMI, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. And he found that of 40,000 NSTEMI, they're diagnosed with NSTEMI by troponin, and they get their angiogram the next day. 10,000 had an occluded artery with no collateral circulation. These patients had higher biomarkers, worse LV, LV function, and double the mortality in spite of the fact that they were on average 15 years younger and had fewer comorbidities. So these are, again, NSTEMI with occlusion versus NSTEMI without occlusion. The NSTEMI with occlusion had double the mortality. Um, and this is another study by Hillinger where we wrote this uh, editorial. And they, in their data, 21% of OMI were diagnosed by S STEMI criteria on the first ECG using a computer on serial ECGs. The computer would measure the ST elevation. It was only 30% sensitive. That's on serial ECGs. A blinded cardiologist with visual ECG interpretation was 49% sensitive. Terrible. You're missing over half of occlusions. So um, I just go to, if you go to my blog, uh, our blog, because Pendle isn't associated to, go to the OMI literature timeline. You can see what's happened in the last few years. In 2021, there are these 16 articles on OMI nomi and six, 11 of the 16 were by Smith and Myers and co-authors. It's very accepted in emergency medicine now. 12 articles are in cardiology journals, nine by me and co-authors, and these are the journals. And then in 2022 and 2023, there are too many papers to keep counting. And they're coming from all over the world, from Poland, OMI, from Spain, acute coronary occlusion and non-STEMI, the 2022 American College of Cardiology Expert Consensus, which I'll tell you more about, United Kingdom and Greece, total coronary occlusion and non-STEMI, of occlusions, inclusions, exclusions from India, STEMI to occlusion MI in Canada and the US, from Turkey. And here's the American College of Cardiology 2022 chest pain guidelines, which now recognize OMI. This is the reference. <clears throat> and this is the, the statement in that article, which refer in reference 21, which is our article comparing the STEMI, non-STEMI to the OMI, NOMI paradigms. And it says, the application of STEMI ECG criteria on a standard 12 lead ECG alone 
will miss a significant minority of patients who have acute coronary occlusion. Therefore, the ECG should be closely examined for subtle changes that may represent initial ECG signs of vessel occlusion, such as hyperacute T waves or ST elevation less than one millimeter. The ACC names five STEMI equivalents, and these are them. In particular, they name hyperacute T waves and posterior only, but they give you no way to diagnose them. They give no definition of hyperacute T waves. They, tell you how, they do not tell you how to recognize them. You need to learn how to do that, and we're going to try to teach you today. And then they use mo the Smith modified scarbosa criteria as well and de Winter T waves. So this is reference 21, where they get that data, comparison of the, the STEMI and STEMI versus OMI NOMI paradigms of acute MI. And this is the main graphic in here. And on the left is peak troponin, which is a good measure of infarct size. And you can see that this is all OMI. This is STEMI positive OMI, people who have STEMI, and this is people who have OMI but don't meet STEMI criteria. These two go into this group, and you can see these two are not very different. These are all NSTEMI. These are patients with non-OMI, no, no occlusion. And these patients with no occlusion who, have, who are tiny infarcts are grouped together into non-STEMI with these patients who have very large infarcts. That doesn't make sense. So these are STEMI, and these are all NSTEMI, which are NSTEMI are very heterogeneous, OMI, STEMI are not. Let's go to this and we look at this. We should do this OMI like this, get rid of N STEMI and STEMI, get rid of N STEMI and have OMI, NOMI. This makes much more sense. Look how different the infarct size is between those two infarcts. So let's look at mortality of N STEMI with OMI. We're, we are just about to submit this, sorry, uh, just about to submit this publication. It, uh, and it was in an abstract in the European Heart Journal no this month, November. God, sorry. Um, and this is mortality at one year. Patients with STEMI have mortality of about 9% here. Patients with NSTEMI OMI have double the mortality. If we go to five years, look at that. This is STEMI, about, still about 9% mortality at five years, whereas NSTEMI OMI has 27% mortality the, the uh, hazard ratio, 2.59. And why is it that NSTEMI OMI are so much worse than STEMI? It's because they get treated so much later. These are NSTEMI OMI. They take 16 hour median time to reperfusion. Whereas if you have a STEMI, people recognize it and take you to the cath lab right away. We need to find all these patients and get them to the cath lab right away. Can we do that? Here's the scope of the problem. There are 125,000 NSTEMI OMI per year in the US approximately, or at least that many, 30% at least are missed by using the STEMI paradigm. The excess mortality over STEMI at one year is 8.2%, at five years, 17.3%. That's 10,000 excess deaths per year in the U.S. at one year, and 21,000 excess deaths at five years, just in the U.S. alone, and lots of heart failure suffering. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> And so we want to, want to know, can we recognize these patients? And so Pendle and I, Pendle, Dr. Myers, we studied uh, 808 patients who were um, suspicion of acute coronary syndrome. And I read 3,800 EKGs and classified them as OMI or not. And we published this paper, Accuracy of OMI ECG Findings versus STEMI Criteria for the Diagnosis of Acute Coronary Occlusion Myocardial Infarction. And my, my ECG diagnosis of OMI versus STEMI Criteria, my sensitivity was 86% versus 41% only for STEMI Criteria. Specificity was equal, and my accuracy was far higher. And these were the seven findings among 146 OMI patients who were identified earlier by expert than by criteria or angiogram. Hyperacute T waves, pathologic Q waves along with subtle ST elevation, terminal QRS distortion, reciprocal ST depression or reciprocal Q wave inversion, subtle ST elevation not meeting criteria but with other features was in 83%. Any amount of ST depression maximal in V4 versus V5 versus V6 was 45%. Any ST elevation inferior leads with any ST depression T inversion AVL. Now, of course, this adds up to way more than 100% because most people with OMI have more than one of these features. And that's what makes it easy for me to recognize. So one ECG principle to remember is this, proportionality. T waves and ST elevation are only large or small relative to the QRS. Here's a 40-year-old woman who came with chest pain. She has a little bit of ST elevation here, not very much. A little bit of reciprocal depression there but it certainly doesn't meet STEMI criteria, but look how small the QRS is. This is critical to reading an EKG. If we stretch the EKG out so that the, this S, the QRS has at least a reasonable size to it, you can see there's massive ST elevation. Proportion is everything on the EKG. And that's why my formula for diagnosing LAD occlusion 
uses R wave amplitude and lead V4 and QRS amplitude and lead V2 as two of the four variables. The two others are QTC, which lengthens in acute coronary occlusion, and ST elevation at 60 milliseconds after the J point and lead V3. Why not the J point? Why 60 milliseconds after? Because 60 milliseconds after the J point is a measurement not only of ST elevation, but of T wave size. So the major learning point here is that only approximately one third of OMI are STEMI and they're missed. ECG diagnosis of STEMI negative OMI is often extremely difficult. Serial ECGs that eventually meet STEMI criteria are recognized earlier by OMI findings, especially hyperacute T waves. This is learnable to some degree with hard work, but you need practice and repetition and artificial intelligence, deep convolutional neural networks are really the answer. We need to stop for a moment and discuss non-occlusion myocardial function. It is important too, of course, you don't wanna miss these. They also need a stent. 90% of them have a culprit, but they have TIMI-3 flow, no active ischemia. There is no ongoing myocardial necrosis. We call them non-OMI. They eventually need an inter intervention, or if they don't get an intervention, then a week later or a month later or a year later or five years later, the, those plaques, which are ruptured, are going to rethrombose and cause a real OMI. So they need an intervention tomorrow. ECGs are nonspecific for these and extremely insensitive. You cannot diagnose them on this. I think the sensitivity in that Hillinger study was 8%. Experts like me and Pendle cannot reliably diagnose these. You, you need troponin to diagnose these, but fortunately, you can wait for troponin. You don't need to diagnose it right away. What is the false positive rate for STEMI criteria? That's the other problem we have to look at. St, ST elevations are not specific for OMI. So what is a false positive rate? Take a guess. The answer is 15 to 30%. And these are the studies that show it. In the Annals of Emergency Medicine, 16% false positive. In JAMA, 14% false positive. McCabe had 29% false positive. And I, I will, uh, you know, I'll tell you more about that a little later. So in a year and a half ago, I gave the annual keynote Kenichi Harumi address to the International Society of Computers and Electrocardiology. The title was, What Should Artificial Intelligence Focus On? The Diagnosis of Acute Coronary Occlusion. For the last decade, the software engineers in uh, EKGs, in 12 lead EKGs, have been concentrating on rhythm abnormalities, especially atrial fibrillation. I've been trying to get them to focus on acute coronary occlusion for years to, to no avail until I gave this talk. And then a whole bunch of people, I showed them all these EKGs, they suddenly became interested in it. The other thing I told them that they need to be able to do, they need to be able to digitize EKGs. So they can take an, e they need to be able to take an EKG off my blog, turn it into an XML file, which is the only kind of file that a, a deep convolutional neural network can manipulate. They need to be able to do that, but no one could do that except powerful medical who came to me, uh, came to me later. I'll tell you about that later. So this is, an e instantly recognizable face, Barack Obama. And this is the guy who impersonates him. He does a really good job. He's very funny. Notice you, you know exactly who is who before with no problem, but you don't need to measure his nose or measure his teeth or his ears or his eyes or anything about him to know it. In fact, there's no way you could describe his face accurately to differentiate it from this. And that is the way an EKG is to me. It is a face to me. I can recognize it. I can't tell you why I know it's an OMI or not an OMI all the time. I try to but I fail most of the time. And that's the way, that's why this is, needs to be done with machine learning. That's what I was trying to tell them in this talk I gave. And so I said, you need to teach, this, teach AI how to recognize these faces. And so this guy, uh, Salah al zaiki he had written a, a, an algorithm to try to diagnose myocardial infarction and it was failing miserably. Why was that? He was trying to diagnose all myocardial infarction with this. He was trying to diagnose OMI and non-OMI, and you can't diagnose non-OMI. It's just impossible. So I told him, you have to focus your machine learning onto OMI. And I helped them give a definition of OMI. And when they did it, they came up with good results. And they found that their ECG smart had a quite good AUC of point, uh, excuse me, of 0.87, which was much better than commercial ECG system or a clinical expert. All right, so AI can do it. This, however, they cannot digitize EKGs. and their system is not a deep convolutional neural network. They took 74 handcrafted features to teach, teach the system. This is almost like a, a conventional algorithm in some respects. So it wasn't a, not one that can keep learning the way a deep convolutional neural network can. The other thing about it is that you can't get this. You can't use it. I can't, I can't 
I can't get a hold of it and try to test it on things myself or use it. So along comes Robert Herman from Powerful Medical, and he tells me he can digitize EKGs, and he has a system, and he, he asked me if I, if I can train his system. I say, Pendle and I can train your system, no problem. And we did that, and we call it the PM Cardio Queen of Hearts AI app. And it's now available in the App Store and Google Play for Android. And uh, this is PM Cardio app. And now we're going to have Robert tell you a little bit about it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for the excellent introduction into the topic. And uh, to just answer maybe a couple of the questions popping up in the Q&A, we will also see live cases very soon. So this was the sort of introductory part uh, of, of the occlusion MI paradigm versus the STEMI non-STEMI paradigm. And I'll proceed with a quick presentation of the results of the validation results. You have been waiting for a couple of months now, and I'm very happy to say that uh, just actually this week, we got confirmation that this will be live uh, on the website of European Heart Journal Digital Health uh, within this week um, in the section of uh, article advances. So. We're currently in the proofreading stage uh, of the accepted manuscript. Perfect. So let's jump right in. And uh, as Steve said, uh, we didn't train an AI system to detect STEMI or non-STEMI. We wanted it to be actually accurate to detect acute coronary occlusion. So training a system for non-STEMI and STEMI is not the way to go. We really train a system that asks and answers the underlying question. And this is whether this is an ECG of a patient with an acutely occluded culprit artery. And to do this, we've, we've trained a deep neural network, uh, deep convolutional neural network on over 18,000 ECGs, where we had the ECGs and the clinically adjudicated, so really core lab, uh, core lab level data uh, of the angiographic outcome. And we allowed the AI model to create its own web of, of deep uh, uh, parameters to associate and discriminate between acute coronary occlusion or not acute coronary occlusion. And really allow the model to, 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 to select its own parameters uh, to, to really di distinguish this from the ECGs. What was the angiographic outcome that we've used as a reference standard in the study? Uh, it was a culprit vessel that was identified angiographically that was either occluded, so TIM is zero to one flow, or it was TIMI 2 or 3 flow, and uh, the patient underwent emergent revascularization. So either emergent PCI or emergent coronary artery bypass grafting. What was the testing cohort? So we've actually pulled in data from three different sources. This was also including external data. Total of three sites participated in this uh, retrospective uh, data collection, and these were ACS patients, consecu con consecutively collected ACS patients stemming from both Europe and the US. Roughly 28% of the patients were from the US and around 20% met the primary outcome definition of acute coronary occlusion based on angiography. Total of 2000 patients uh, made it into the final testing cohort and we've pulled all of their EC ECGs, a total of 3,004 ECGs. And in a blinded independent evaluation, we've compared the AI model, so the queen of hearts, as you know it, to the STEMI criteria based on the fourth universal definition of MI, annotated by uh, physicians blinded to the entire clinical course of the patient. And of course, also ECG experts on the call and on the webinar uh, here today, Dr. Stephen Smith and Dr. Pendle Mayers uh, participating as well blinded to any clinical information uh, in this benchmark comparison. So really for the entire uh, validation set that we've seen before, so the 2,222 patients, all of their ECGs, we actually had three votes uh, respecting a very accurate comparison and fair comparison. So really the OMI AI model, ECG experts. And as you can see, the, the OMI model, so the Queen of Hearts, discriminated very well with an AUC of 0 0.938, uh, with a sensitivity of 81% and a specificity of 94% at the optimal threshold. 
I think there was a question about the specificity of ECG experts. So you see ECG experts, uh, Dr. Stephen Smith and Pendle Mayers uh, have a, sp a specificity of 95.7% of this data set. And STEMI criteria really denote the current standard of care in many centers, very poor sensitivity of only 32% uh, uh, meeting the primary outcome, uh, detecting the primary angiographic outcome of occlusion. And we've also compared the AI model, uh, not just at the optimal threshold, but also matched it to the, to the specificity of the STEMI criteria demarking the standard of care, which was around 97%. And we were able to show that even at this 97% uh, specificity, where uh, the AI model is able to uh, pick up twice as many cases uh, of an acute uh, coronary occlusion, thus having a two times uh, higher sensitivity than uh, the STEM criteria. We've also performed uh, very uh, extensive subgroup analysis showing the AI model performance across various uh, baseline demographic and presentation subgroups, uh, and also electrocardiographic, various electrocardiographic rhythms and patterns. And of note here is the very high specificity in uh, patients with tachycardic ECGs and also high specificity in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. This is quite surprising. And these, these patients, uh, so the ECGs uh, that meet this criteria, so atrial fibrillation rhythm and high heart rate, they're usually also the ones that cause false positive cath lab activation. We see that the AI model is 99.3% specific in these atrial fibrillation cases and 90, around 97% specific in tachycardic ECGs. Of note as well, the sensitivity did not differ uh, according to the culprit artery territory of the, of the, of the patient. Next, we've also scrutinized the AI model performance across stricter and less strict definition of occlusion. And you might have seen a couple of studies uh, using the following outcome. Uh, so Mayers et al, the first study showing the ECG expert uh, interpretation of acute coronary occlusion versus STEMI criteria and also the, rec the, the recent Alzheimer's methodology used the following uh, definition of acute coronary occlusion. As you can see, using this following definition where a higher infarct size is, is required in patients with an, with an open cul culprit lesion, the AI model actually has even higher sensitivity of 84.5%. For the ones that really want the strictest definition, we also in the study present data on this uh, very strict definition of occlusion. So what are the key take-home messages from this study? So this is the first deep neural network methodology detecting acute coronary occlusion, myocardial infarction, not on the basis of STEMI or non-STEMI criteria, but really asking the underlying question of acute coronary occlusion uh, evidenced angiographically. This was a multi-center international validation in retrospective cohorts of consecutive ACS patients patients uh, presenting to three various sites, two of them in the US. We've shown that the AI model, the Queen of Hearts, has two times higher sensitivity in detecting angiographic outcome of acute coronary occlusion compared to the standard of care. And in patients that later develop a STEMI on the ECG, the AI model is able to pick up these uh, uh, precursors, so the hyperacute T waves, usually the hyperacute phases of, of occlusion, three hours faster than the standard of care. Lastly, the AI, uh, the OMI AI ECG model, so the queen of arts, is paired with uh, proprietary ECG digitization technology and works with any image of a 12-bit ECG. So as I said, these results are uh, soon published. Uh, you, can, you can see the entire study uh, online very soon, uh, hopefully this week. And if you follow us on social, social media, I think you will not miss it. So back to you, Stephen. Okay, sorry. Yes, yeah, so we're back to the beginning where we had the 60-year-old with sudden epigastric pain radiating to the chest. And 
I noted the hypercute T waves here and here, and it was this was sent to me later with no information. And I said it was an acute LED occlusion, and I was I didn't have high certainty, but I was pretty sure. And the first troponin came back under the URL, and they waited, and they waited six hours, and it was 100% LED occlusion. The peak troponin was very high with 35% ejection fraction and new heart failure. And remember that di that worthless diagnosis of NSTEMI? And, and I sent this to uh, the queen of hearts, and she diagnoses OMI with high confidence. She sees this hyper-QT or in this hyper-QT wave, high confidence. And here's, she, she has explainability. She's telling you exactly what she sees on this EKG. And it's that hyper-QT wave there and that one there. And uh, so the diagnosis is not NSTEMI. Let's get rid of that. Let's call it an, what it is. It's an OMI. And if we later found the old EKG, this is what her, this man's T wave looks like at baseline. And this is what it looks like when there's an acute coronary occlusion. So we're gonna show you some more cases and I'm gonna have Pendle discuss, discuss them. Here's one that was texted to me. I was in a meeting and it just said 46 year old with chest pain. Pendle, what do you think? All right, so <clears throat> to start things off with this case, we're looking at a very subtle posterolateral lateral homing here. So the, uh, the most specific feature to me is what Steve's pointing at, which is the inappropriate ischemic ST depression in lead V2 and V3, a little bit still there in V4 and then gone by V5. So this is ST depression maximal and leads V1 through V4, in this case, probably V2 or V3. We've shown that's very specific in an ACS context for posterior only. And then right next to the posterior wall, we have the lateral wall. Part of that shows up in leads one and ABL. Lead ABL by itself, I, I could have called a normal amount of ST elevation. However, when I look in the reciprocal lead, lead three, there is reciprocal ST depression, a reciprocal T wave inversion, a down up T wave. So to me, that makes it very specific that the high lateral walls also involved in this only. So postero lateral only, very likely to be missed. Okay, so I saw the same thing and I texted back to my partner, activate the cath lab. And she did activate the cath lab. And I also sent this to the queen uh, just to see what, oh, we, uh, these are, remember, these are the seven findings that we, in our study that were findings of subtle OMI, hyper-QT waves, pathologic Q waves. In this, in this one, it's any amount of ST depression, V1 to V4, we, we talked about, and reciprocal ST depression, depression or reciprocal T wave inversion down here. Any ST elevation, excuse me, subtle ST elevation, not meeting criteria, but with other features, which would be that there. And so it has three of the seven features in it. And I sent it to the queen. And oh, and by the way, it was a posterior lateral OMI with an acute obtuse marginal occlusion. And this very subtle EKG had a massive myocardial infarction. And we sent it to the queen and she gets it. OMI with high confidence, just based on those very subtle findings. So let's go to another case. Pendle? Okay, this, this, time, this is a this is a, uh, uh, someone with chest pain. Sure. So here we have a, a tricky anterolateral and apical only. So the, the, the most important features here are that we recognize the hyperacute T waves, especially in V2, V3, V4, V5 area. Those are clearly the most diagnostic. They are they have too much area for their QRS. They have a diminished R wave, which is a feature of LED occlusions that differentiates them from normal variant elevation. And these T waves are symmetric and pumped up like a hyperacute T wave. They are in the LED distribution. The complicating feature of this CCG is that there's also OMI findings in the inferior leads, two, three, and ABF. So many LED occlusions, uh, basically all LEDs supply the apex of the heart. And the apex, depending on the patient's anatomy, can sometimes and often does show up in the inferior leads. So many LED occlusions do not have that comforting reciprocal ST depression in the inferior leads. About 50% of LED occlusions do not have that ST depression. And so this ECG is very risky because people will say that these findings are diffuse, or they will say there's no reciprocal ST depression. There certainly is. You just don't have the posterior leads to see it. So a very, very difficult LED occlusion for many people because they'll say diffuse or no reciprocal depression, but it's diagnostic as LED occlusion. Okay, this patient was seen by an intern who reads my blog re regularly, and he immediately recognized that this is an LED occlusion. Uh, he activated the cath lab. Uh, again, here, hyper-acute T-waves are the, the main feature of these seven features we found. And uh, he activated the cath lab, and there's the LED occluded. 
and now there's a wire through it so there's some flow and then a stent is put in and completely fl the, the flow is perfect in the LED all because an intern found that and we send it to the queen and what does the queen say Omi with high confidence let's go to the next case oh no sorry this is uh the explainability and again finding it is for the queen of hearts and so this very dark blue here is is being highlighted and so is the t-wave here with the straightened st segment the straightened st segment makes the t-wave wide and fat she sees that now we'll go on to the next case okay this time we have a very subtle inferior and posterior only maybe also a touch lateral so the most diagnostic lead i think by far is lead v2 yet again with inappropriate SC depression for a normal QRS complex. Very, very unusual in normal people at baseline. They don't have that. In fact, they have normal elevation. That's why the ridiculous semi criteria had to be raised in leads V2 and V3 to accommodate for every normal person's normal elevation in lead V2. Depression there, very uncommon, very specific. That's posterior only. Now I also notice very subtle inferior only. These two waves in lead 2, 3 ABF could have been within normal limits, except that I look at AVL and it has a negative reciprocal hyperacute T wave. So now we have posterior only as well as inferior only. What's next door to posterior wall? The lateral wall. V6 has the tiniest impression of, of elevation there. It's very small. I won't, I won't belabor it. Definitely inferior posterior only, maybe also a little bit of lateral extension. Okay. And of these features here, we have hypercute T waves. We have um, any amount of ST depression in V1 to V4. We have reciprocal T wave inversion right here. We have subtle ST elevation not meeting criteria right there. And so the four, four different features on this EKG that help you to diagnose acute OMI. If you send it to the queen, she gets OMI with high confidence. 100% RCA occlusion, Timmy zero flow. And there's the explainability. She, she concentrates on B2 as the most remarkable lead. High confidence right there. Let's go on to the next case. This is a case I saw. The residents came running to me with this EKG saying, oh my God, this patient's having a myocardial infarction. Pendle, what do you think? Exactly. So here we have the opposite situation. We have an EKG that has many leads with massive ST elevation. And, and yet, even though it meets semi criteria in, in all these areas, this is a false positive. It's a fake. It's a normal variant ECG. Some people will have to call that benign early recall. That's okay. How, how do we know that this elevation is, nor, is normal variant and nothing compared to acute coronary occlusion? Sometimes it's hard to say in words, but there are some things we can pick out of here that I can describe in words. First of all, there's massive voltage in all of these leads that have the elevation. Leads that are undergoing OMI usually don't have massive QRSs. In fact, they have diminution of their R waves. These elevations are preceded by a very, very definitive J wave in many leads, like V4, V5, V6, lead one, two, three, ABF. They all have picture perfect classic J waves, which are mostly very protective against having OMI as that morphology. Lead V2 has what we call saddleback morphology, which is a very protective feature. Um, and um, overall, those are some of the things that help me recognize that this is not due to acute coronary occlusion. This is a patient's normal variant ECG. And indeed, it was a normal variant. The patient ruled out by serial troponins. We send it to the queen OMI with high confidence. And there's the explainability. And you can see that she she actually missed part of that R wave there. The R wave actually goes way up to here, but still it highlighted this R wave amplitude, the, uh, the, the voltage with very dark blue and very dark blue here. She sees that high amplitude QRS and knows that that is what makes it not an OMI. Let's go to the next case. Oh, these are two patients who both presented with acute chest pain. Are, is one of them OMI? Are both of them OMI? Are they not OMI? Which? Both? Neither? Let's ask Pendle. I love these comparison cases. It feels like you're at the optometrist and you're choosing between A and B. And I think this is a really good way to teach subtle ECG findings and how it's not about elevation. It's sometimes it's not something you can put in words. So um, 
while I've been talking, hopefully you try to pick which one is which or both. Um, the top one looks like acute coronary occlusion to me in the um, sort of South African flag distribution. That's uh, leaves one AVL and V2 have elevation and hyperacute G waves, and then the reciprocal findings in three and AVF. And then the bottom EKG looks a lot like it, doesn't it? But there are morphology features here that are very different, actually, than the, the EKG on the top. So, for example, this, the, uh, the slope and the morphology of the ST segments in the top EKG, the one with OMI, has a straight ST segment that launches into that, that T wave. It actually has a fair bit of volume under it, whereas the bottom ECG has more of a scooped out, non OMI appearing ST segment. Both of these cases have T wave inversion in three, and yet they look different especially AVF looks very different. AVF in the top ECG has a ischemic down up reciprocal SC depression look, whereas the bottom one does not. And lead V2 looks real in the top ECG and faker to me in the bottom ECG. So it's, you could never put in words, like if you, Steve, if you put up our table here of those findings, both of these ECGs. Oh, okay, where is the, let's see the table. Okay, uh, well, do the queen first. Okay. We'll yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, we sent it to the Queen of Hearts, and she got the the top one right that it's Omi with high confidence. She got the bottom one correct that it's not Omi with high confidence. She can just like we see these like their faces to us. She sees it like their faces to her, even though it's very difficult to give any verbal or numerical number to what's the different what the difference is. And um, here's the explainability on those two cases. And you can see she's seeing especially that inverted negative, very large negative T wave. There's very little amplitude to that QRS, but there's lots of volume to this negative T wave, which is reciprocal to that. So she knows that this is OMI. And she also sees that, that hyperacute T wave there. As for the one that is not OMI with high confidence, she just doesn't mark much. She doesn't see anything there, which is appropriate. And if we look, put up the table here, uh, hyperacute T waves are one thing that was there. Reciprocal T wave inversion was present on this one. Um, subtle ST elevation not meeting criteria, but with other features. Uh, and I think that's all we have from the table on this one. Let's go to another one. Pendle. Okay, now we have um, inferior and posterior OMI, and also another finding on top of that. But for the inferior posterior OMI, um, I guess the easiest part is lead three that has have um, ST elevation there and it has reciprocal depression and lead AVL also bleeding out into lead one as well. Um, that's that's inferior. We also have elevation AVF. Um, and then for posterior only, we have again, ST depression V2, V3, V4 that shouldn't be there. On top of that, the ST depression keeps going into V5 and V6. That to me, I would call that a, a superimposed component of subendocardial ischemia. So we have OMI plus Seven the cardiac ischemia. It's a little bit more complex, but anytime both of those are on the EKG, I'm, I'm going to focus on the most important part to me, which is OMI. So I think this is inferior posterior OMI. Take it away. And so I was uh, going through our, our EKG system, just reading EKGs one after the other. And I came across this one. I go, oh, cool, a subtle inferior OMI. And so I always look into the patient's chart when I see this. And I was disappointed to find out that the physician, my partner who had taken care of this patient had not noticed this. And it was six hours later when the troponins came back that he finally got the patient to the cath lab and the patient lost a lot of myocardium. And um, so unfortunately, I, I, I obviously educated him on that. And he was very disappointed with himself for not having seen that because I talk about this all the time in our department, but these things are very hard to see. They're very hard for people to, to see even when they know about them and are trained. So. Um, don't kick yourself if you don't get it, but just keep trying and use the queen because if you, this patient had 100 minutes of chest pain when this was, was recorded. And on here, what do we have? We have um, subtle ST elevation, not meeting criteria, but with other features. We have any ST elevation inferior leads with any ST depression T inversion in AVL. We have any amount of ST depression in V4 to V1 to V4. Uh, and uh, maybe we even have some terminal QRS distortion there. There's no S wave. Uh, that's not as specific in inferior MI as it is in V2 and V3 for LAD occlusion. But if you send this to the queen, she gets it immediately. Omi with high confidence. Let's go to the next case. Oh, sorry. Uh, explainability. 
in the explainability, it's AVL, which really gets her that ST depression here and also in lead one, and then a little bit of something in, v, in V2. Now let's go to the next phase, sorry about that. Okay, 60 year old with acute chest pain. Okay, this time we have another posterior OMI and also lateral, so posterior lateral OMI. Um, the easiest finding, again, ST depression that shouldn't be there, maximal in V2 and V3, um, that's posterior. And then an interesting finding here in V6. So Steve, so there's a hyperacute G wave in V6. There's a little bit of elevation. And Steve just told us about terminal QRS distortion. That's happening, it's almost happening in V6. So the elevation of the T wave is rising up and lifting the back of the QRS off of off of uh, off the ground. And it's destroying the back of the QRS, moving up into the QRS. That's called terminal QRS distortion. But so, again, we have here uh, any amount of ST depression maximal V1 V4. We have terminal QRS distortion and maybe some hyperqtos. I'm not sure I call them yet. But anyway, the, I activated the cath lab based on this EKG and the cardiology fellow came down to the emergency department. And he said, well, that's not a STEMI. And I said, you're right. It's not a STEMI. It's an OMI. And while we were waiting for the cath team to come in, because it was uh, in the late evening, uh, we got another EKG and there it was. And now uh, why don't you uh, describe that one too, Pendle? So it's all the same uh, areas, just everything's more dramatic and more uh, diagnostic. So the uh, depression is still there in V2, V3, and almost V4. But by the time it's getting to V4, it has, it's flipping around to become lateral. And so you have hyperacute two waves now in V4, V5, V6, elevation in V5, 6, 1, and ADL. It may even meet any criteria. There's now depression in three that wasn't there before because the AVL OMI has come out to, to be seen a lot better. So a much easier ECP. So if we again look at the table, there's now there's hyperacute T waves, there's any amount of ST depression V1 to V4, uh, there's any ST elevation, subtle ST elevation not meeting criteria, but with other features, there's even some terminal QRS distortion there now. So uh, this, these table, this table of findings can help you. And of course, uh, you, let's put these side by side and you can see that these are relatively normal T waves. These are hyperacute T waves. Notice they are no taller this is no taller than that. This is no taller than that. It's how wide and bulky it is in relation to the QRS. These are massive, massive wide. And that's the difference. If you send this, uh, uh, send this turned out to be 100% first diagonal occlusion, and the troponin I peaked at greater than 50,000, a very large acute OMI. And if you send it to the queen, this first one, the one without the hyperacute TOAs, she knows immediately that's OMI and has high confidence. Let's go to the next case. Oh, sorry, explainability. Steve again. Pendle. Really yeah. awesome cases, and I think uh, also great to see your your thought process behind these cases and and you diagnosing Omi. I think we have time for one more case, and then we'll okay. move into the questions. Uh, for the audience, we have roughly thirty eight questions in the in the Q and A box, so feel free to also upvote uh, the questions that that interest you the most, so we can cover them. And feel free to add add some more uh, while we review the last case uh, of the webinar. Okay, here we go. Um, this was texted to me. This is a photo of a computer screen. So my my partner took a photo of the computer screen, and then he uploaded it to the to the Queen of Hearts. And the Queen says not Omi with low confidence. And I looked at this and I, I texted him back. I said I am not confident. I I am even less confident than the Queen. I think these are hypercute T waves. So I think it might be a false negative. And so I, I went into the patient's chart. And well, why, why, don't, you, why don't you talk about it, uh, Pendle? I agree. This one's harder. But the, the main question is, uh, V2, 3, 4, 5, 6, are these hyperacute T waves? They are big. They're symmetric. They're, um, if I had a baseline, I'd, I'd love to be able to see if they're bigger than baseline. But with five in a row like that, um, there's elevation in V4 and V5. I think you have to be worried about that being LED occlusion until proven otherwise. Okay, so I went into the chart to get a better EKG, went right uh, and, and was able to, to get, um, get it right off the screen. And this is a perfect EKG. And then I uploaded it to the queen and she came back with OMI with high confidence. So uh, the, the image quality, even though the, the taking a photo of the EKG and upload it to the queen is a very good way of getting the right diagnosis. If, if, there's, if it's not high confidence, then you need to get a better image and this is what she comes back with high confidence. Indeed, this was an acute LED occlusion. So I guess uh, Robert wants us to stop here for a question. Since, 
it's hard for me to stop because I got so many great cases. I just want to keep keep showing you. And I think people would stay here for hours <laughs> listening yeah. to you. I um, think this case also shows quite an important aspect of the of the Queen of Hearts and and actually digitizing ECGs. If you go back a couple of slides to the original image, uh, you can really see that the entire ECG is not visible here. So really, the first the first beat of one, two, and lead one, two, and three is cut off, and this has quite a substantial impact on the on the resulting digitization. So really, if 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 uh, physicians and healthcare professionals are trying to scan ECGs, they should really capture the entire waveform. Awesome, awesome presentation, and awesome. Uh, I would say cases presented live and also awesome walk through these cases. We're going to move into the Q&A. And I think there are a couple of questions relating the same topic. And the topic here is uh, NOMI and the diagnosis of NOMI. I think, Steve, you touched on it very briefly in the introduction. But yeah. uh, there are two questions on this topic. Other than subentocardial ischemia, is there any other ECG findings suggestive of NOMI? And also another question relating to this. In your blog, there is a lot of focus on OMI. Thank you for that, but there is not much discussion of NOMI. Could you please talk about why we can't diagnose NOMI? If the paradigm is about differentiating OMI from NOMI, how can we not be able to diagnose NOMI I assume from the ECG, which is important here. Okay, we if a patient comes in with they they come and they say they have chest pain, and very frequently the chest pain is no longer there; it's gone, and you don't know what it was. You look at the the patient no longer has active chest pain; they no longer have active ischemia, and it's active ischemia that is most easy to see on the EKG. E ischemia that was in the past is not so easy to see. And, and so you get the EKG and it's normal or non-diagnostic. It has these little T-wave, non-diagnostic T-wave changes, a little bit of minor ST depression or T-wave inversion, or maybe uh, something you just can't say is one thing or another. And that's why they're called non-diagnostic STT findings. And then you know that, but you should know that the patient could have a myocardial infarction. They, if, and so, so that's why we get troponin. And if the troponin comes back, what's happened to that patient? Well, they had a little plaque rupture. And maybe they had a maybe they had a brief total occlusion that completely lysed, but more light, more often they had some platelet uh, platelet fibrin aggregates that formed during that plaque rupture, and they showered downstream and they clogged a few little tiny arterioles, gave the patient some brief chest pain, and 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 led to some myocardial necrosis and troponin release. Those patients don't need any intervention right now, but they do have a ruptured plaque that that is vulnerable to occluding sometime in the next year. So they do need a stent. And those that's about half of MI are those kind of non-OMI. They're diagnosed with troponin, not with EKG. And that's okay. Now, if the patient has continued chest pain and the troponin comes back and is rising and there's nothing on the EKG that you can see that's OMI, but the patient has continued pain, those patients have to go to the cath lab because the EKG is not 100% sensitive for OMI either. I've seen plenty of cases who have acute total coronary occlusion and a totally normal EKG. But the way I diagnosed them and got them to the cath lab was they had persistent chest pain and an elevated troponin. And I had no other reason for them to have an elevated troponin. They didn't have a pulmonary embolism. They didn't have heart failure. They didn't have renal failure. They had that elevated troponin. The only explanation I had was this patient's chest pain is due to acute coronary syndrome, even though it's not an EKG. And that patient goes to the cath lab. And that is why the European... Society of Cardiology recommends that patients who you think have ACS should get angiogram in less than two hours, regardless of ECG or biomarker findings. Okay, so those are the, those are the ones that need to go to the cath lab now. But non-OMI, our patients are about half of all myocardial infarction, maybe a little more than half, and they don't need an angiogram right now. They have a, 90 percent of them have a culprit. How about the other 10 percent? The other 10 percent are called Minoka myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. That's a very complicated group of patients. I don't have time to discuss that here, but um, about 90% of patients with non-OMI do have a culprit. They do need a stent. You'll only diagnose with them, them with troponin, not with the EKG, but that's okay because they don't need their intervention until tomorrow. Great answer, Steve. Pendle, anything to add there? Yeah. 
you're muted. Well, no, I think that sounds great, Robbie. Um, how about our next question? Awesome. So I think like a couple of questions uh, down the same same sort of uh, thought process. And uh, this is something that we obviously also see when talking to a lot of sites. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how to convince in, in uh, apostrophes our cardiology colleagues to start thinking about the OMI paradigm? I'm guessing from your comments, you've had uh, multiple discussions with them in your clinical work. Pendle, maybe off to you. Sure, I mean, that's obviously the hardest question. It's the question that we get, you know, every time we ever talk about this. Um, a lot of it is um, being humble, you know, and when you're talking to the consultant and the actual heat of the battle, um, not trying to be confrontational, but rather trying to say, just frankly, please, I think this patient has this problem, and I think maybe you're the only one that can help them. You know, if, if it turns out to be a false positive, well, that's going to be okay for everybody, but we just we really don't want to miss this in this patient, and please, can you help me? That's kind of um, that's kind of what we're recommending in during the actual case, but really off the field, you, you really need to be changing things like long term with these people. So you need to be setting up a you know a meeting where you can stop um, avoiding talking about the instabies with occlusion, right? So I sit in a um, I sit in a meeting every month where we talk about all of the STEMI patients, any patient who got a STEMI label, and we go through ad nauseum figuring out why their delay was five more minutes to the cath lab. And then we don't ever talk about the in STEMI patients who have an 18 hour delay to the cath lab. So making a meeting with, the, with these people where you can together look at these cases of in STEMIs that go unrecognized and then talk about them together collaboratively can start to set up, can start to get rid of the the no false negative paradox. Because if you're actually looking at your results for your patients with NSTEMIs who have delays, people start to understand that that paradox exists. So you have things you can do during the moment, which is relying on your guidelines of active ongoing pain and rising proponents, which is a emergent cath lab activation no matter where you live in every, every part of the world, um, regardless of the EKG. You can just frankly just ask, just beg them to help, help you and help the patient. And then off the field, you can hopefully set up a long-term process where you really um, start to recognize these problems together with both services. Awesome, thanks, Pendle. I think Steve, uh, you 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 have quite a nice environment uh, over at Hennepin. I've I've experienced it myself, uh, where yeah. where you you've discussed a lot of cases, and I think people are a bit more aware uh, of. Of, of the of the OMI paradigm uh, in, in in your center, anything to add on this topic of you know discussing uh, well, at, at uh, cases? My center, at my center, it got that way because we had a total disaster of a case in 2012 that uh, I vociferously complained about, and um, uh, it was it was a very difficult time for me. When I complained about this case, there was a 27-year-old young, healthy woman who had a sudden acute occlusion, and uh, it was to me it was obvious on the EKG. To them, it wasn't, and they wouldn't take her to the cath lab, and she died. And so I made a fuss over it. And the outcome of the, the fuss was that if the emergency physician activates cath lab, they have to come in no matter what. And um, so now that was 12 years ago, and does that still? Are they still doing that? Not exactly, but they they much more respect the idea that you can have a deadly acute coronary occlusion that doesn't that they don't see on the EKG, and so you ha you have to just somehow make it clear to them that many acute coronary occlusions are invisible to them on the EKG. Yeah, it's unfortunate that you know tragedy has to sort of. Uh nudge the change but uh, hopefully hopefully a lot of the other centers can uh, sort of jump the ship uh, uh, earlier before that happens um, a couple of questions about pm cardio so let me tackle those uh, sort of at once um, you can also actually scan the qr code on the slide uh, to to try try out pm cardio for free PM Cardio is a class to be medical device that is C certified under the medical device regulation in Europe. So it's certified in Europe, currently pending uh, FDA approval. 
Uh, so we're currently in the 510k process. You can download the PM Cardio app uh, virtually from anywhere, but uh, in the registration process, there is a list of supported countries. If your country is not supported on the list, uh, you can still register the waiting list uh, through the through the Powerful Medical uh, website, and uh, uh, we are running pilots uh, in many countries also. Uh, in the countries where we're still pending regulatory clearance. So that should answer the question if PM Cardio is avail uh, available outside Europe. A couple of questions on the performance of the, of the Queen of Hearts. So as you can see, we're quite transparent with the performance and uh, there is a, also very in-depth uh, uh, subgroup analysis presented in the, in the study. This is something that other AI models uh, or publications of, of validation studies of our other AI models rarely do. But uh, you can see that there is a reduced uh, performance uh, currently in the left bundle branch block and pace scenarios. The pace scenarios are quite heavily affected also by the ECG digitization. So this is something that we are trying to address in the future versions. Left bundle branch block um, is a challenging uh, setting to diagnose OMI in. Uh, by itself, but we're actually working on an external validation study in a cohort of, of exactly left bundle branch block and paste ECGs. Maybe Steve, you can give us a couple of words about this, uh, this about study. About left block and paste them? You want me to show a couple cases? Yes. I can do that. Uh, about, the, about the validation study that we're currently uh, uh, doing on that. So I think I think you and your uh, researchers, I think Ken Dodd, uh, they they have put together yeah. well, the largest. We we, we did the we've uh, derived the Smith modified Scarbus criteria in 2012, and then uh, Pendle. Requiring fast emergent coronary therapy, which was 16 site center uh, 16 center study of paste rhythm OMI versus not OMI. And we found that the Smith modified scar bus criteria are very sensitive and specific. And so we have all those EKGs from the first study by Ken Dodd and the, by me and Ken Dodd and the paste study by me and Ken Dodd. And we have to take all those EKGs, which amount to several hundred and teach the, teach the queen how to make that differentiation. And so obviously we're always improving the queen of hearts. Um, this version one is trained on 18,000 ECGs and we're, we're focusing the next training round on exactly the subgroups where the performance was a bit lower in this initial study. Uh, so expect, uh, you know, regular updates of the Queen of Hearts uh, as we, as we uh, crunch in the cases uh, that the Queen of Hearts uh, learns from. Maybe off to a off to a different question. Um, I think this is quite a quite a relevant question, uh, especially in the setting of, of of managing ACS in the rural areas. In the settings of no PCI or angio facility, do you co confidently do a thrombolysis in OMI positives? And I think the question here is uh, aimed at the non STEMI OMI, so STEMI negative OMI positives. Do you have any any thoughts about that, Steve or Pendle? This this used to be a much much harder question to answer um, until at least in the U.S. It, it used to be a hard question to answer because the the guidelines didn't really have your back uh, for giving thrombolytics very much in if the if the patient had subtle OMI without STEMI. However, last year, um, as we've probably mentioned four or five times already in this talk, the um, AHA ACC formally recommended for the first time in history five STEMI equivalent ECG findings that are supposed to be treated exactly the same lytics if far away from PCI as STEMIs. So those five findings include the hyperacute T waves, de winter morphology, which is a flavor of hyperacute T waves, the modified Scarbosa criteria for uh, paste and for left bundle, and posterior MI. So I think those now give us a lot more safety from a guideline perspective um, to treat with thrombolytics if your certainty is very high, and how do you get high certainty? Well, that takes a lot of experience. Um, hopefully soon, uh, you know, this product will be able to provide an increased level of certainty. But the question is, if you are totally certain that the patient is having acute OMI and doesn't have too many criteria, but has some ECG findings, hopefully 
those guidelines will have your back to do the right thing, which is, in my opinion, to give the thrombolytics as you would for the study patient. Steve, do you have any difference in opinion there? I, I would add a couple things. I, the, the already, you know, without the queen of hearts, just using STEMI criteria, remember we have lots of false positives. And so you're already treating a lot of people with thrombolytics who don't actually have a myocardial infarction. Unless, unless, if you're not doing that, then you're missing a lot of people with even STEMI who need it. So you're always, there are always going to be some people who you're treating who ultimately don't have an OMI. That's just part of the part of the whole thing. And all those randomized trials back in the 1980s, they treated a lot of people without without uh, an OMI as well. The other thing I'd say is that it's a, your pretest probability is really important. If someone comes in, if it's a 20 year old who's coming in with, uh, you know shortness of breath or something, and the, and the, it has some ST elevation, then you should be a lot more skeptical than if it's somebody who's uh, 55 years old and has acute chest pain that they've never had before. Uh, so the pretest probability is critical to all of these. You know, if you look at, we just did a, let me just give you one other thing. We just studied our pre-hospital activations at Hennepin County Medical Center. Over the last two years, we had 140 of them. We, we looked at them all, 23 we had to exclude for various reasons. So the 117 pre-hospital cath lab activations, and only 48 of those actually had OMI. So there were 69 false positives. Um, we, we put all those through the queen of hearts and 40 of those false positives were identified as false positives by the queen of hearts. So if the queen of hearts only had 29, excuse me, yeah, 29 false positives, not 69. And so you're gonna have fewer false positives use, using the queen of hearts and your use of thrombolytics will be even more precise using the queen of hearts than they are using STEMI. Perfect, Steve. And uh, there are actually multiple studies going on, uh, uh, external studies and, and also fully independent studies that should uh, yield some more evidence very soon. Uh, the pre-hospital activation cohort at, over at Hennepin County Medical Center is one of those, but there are several, several groups studying the Queen of Arts in different settings, out of hospital cardiac arrest, uh, intensive care unit patients, uh, or patients, uh, pa or various sub subpopulations of ACS. Um, there is a question from Hassan, a question to Professor Smith. Uh, the Queen had amazing results over expert reading. How do you see this AI model being implemented in the clinical practice? What is the future? I think the future is that if, if you're worried that your patient is having an acute myocardial infarction, that you should use the queen of hearts. And if the queen of hearts says, especially if it says OMI with high confidence, you should activate the cath lab. Uh, unless, you are, unless you are really expert at it and you can tell that she's giving you a false positive, which is very difficult to tell. You have to really be an expert to be better than the queen. Awesome. And as I mentioned before, you can just scan the QR code uh, on the slide here to get uh, access to PM Cardio, which is a free app that you can download off the App Store. There are a couple of cases. Uh, you can try the Queen of Hearts on for free. And then there is a subscription, uh, that uh, monthly subscription or actually what we prefer is really working with uh, sites to get the queen of hearts uh, for all of their physicians and healthcare professionals uh, so, that, uh, so that they have it available uh, on their phones. A couple of questions about the features of the queen of hearts. Um, I think there is a question from Dr. Sagun. Are these darker blue uh, visualizations, I would assume, available for us to use uh, in the app. Uh, the app currently doesn't have the AI explainability feature. This is a research feature that we're still currently developing. And uh, it is currently uh, available for sites that pilot the technology with us. And uh, it, is, it is something that we are hoping to study a bit more before bringing it, bringing it into the main product. A couple of questions on the way the Queen of Hearts works. So does the Queen of Hearts take into account the distribution of findings or just individual lead interpretations? So Queen of Hearts actually uses uh, features extracted uh, uh, through the uh, data input process from all the leads. So it actually also 
combines information from other leads. A um, couple of questions on how the study was performed, yeah. how, how the Queen of Hearts was evaluated. Uh, so we used both single ECGs, so the initial ECGs at presentation or multiple ECGs for patients presenting um, to the participating sites in the in the validation. Steve, uh, you had a question? Yeah, Robert, I need to say, say a couple things. First, remember that version one does not compare with a previous EKG or an old EKG. And that, that's really critical. So if you have a previous EKG to compare with, use it. If you always get serial EKGs in a patient you're worried about. Uh, so, and, and the other thing when you say is version one, if, if, the, if there's an OMI that's reperfused and has T, T wave inversion, the, the queen is gonna tell you it's an OMI even though the, the artery is open. So that's version one. Later versions will be able to differentiate between a reperfused OMI and an active and an active OMI, and also between an acute and a subacute OMI. So right now, it's 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 not. Um, th there are some things about it you have to understand to use it correctly. Definitely, definitely. Maybe also worth mentioning here is the the fact that the Queen of Hearts is currently calibrated for. Uh, a suspect ACS patient population. So obviously you should not use the Queen of Hearts on any random ECGs performed routinely. Uh, what we find uh, a couple of uh, couple of issues with uh, currently with version one is uh, scanning in old MI patients. Uh, so completely asymptomatic uh, old MI patients who had an MI uh, a couple of months or years ago, uh, who still have this LV aneurysm morphology, these uh, these do not uh, sort of fit the current intended use population for for the Queen of Hearts. So that's and that's that goes along with my admonition: the the patient has to have a high pretest probability. Those are the patients you want to use it on. And um, Robert, tell us more when version two will be, be available. Will it diagnose LV aneurysm and those sorts of things? So we're working on version two and version two will not only have uh, the training set expanded, so a lot more cases to train the deep neural network from, uh, but we're also working on expanding the granularity of the Queen of Hearts, so the granularity of the output. So currently the Queen of Hearts says OMI or not OMI. We're looking to train the Queen of Hearts to differentiate active OMI from reperfused OMI because we we are reperfusing OMI because we assume that the the highest benefit for emergent uh, cattle of activation will be in the in the group of active OMIs and also potentially in the future identification of various various mimicking patterns of, 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 of OMI, especially in those cases where uh, the physicians are just convinced of, of, of this being a STEMI. I think it's important to also show what it is uh, uh, if it's not an occlusion and uh, especially these cases, uh, especially these cases are quite tough uh, to differentiate currently. A couple of questions about the pre-hospital setting. So a question from Mark, uh, roughly 70% of STEMIs come in by ambulance transport. Of these only one third get identified as suspected STEMI pre-hospitally. What is your advice to EMS to provide STEMI in brackets, OMI or other field diagnoses? Is the Queen of Hearts program something that can be downloaded to our field monitors when assessing patients pre-hospitally. Pre uh, so to answer the second question first, uh, yes, the Queen of Hearts works with uh, pre-hospital ECGs. I think here a very valuable point is the fact that the Queen of Hearts is paired with the ECG digitization technology. A lot of the sites that we're working with are actually receiving transfers and these ECGs are virtually never available uh, digitally. They're not sent digitally to the, to the transferring or to the receiving hospital. And with the Queen of Hearts, you can just take a picture of the ECG or upload an existing ECG in your gallery. And uh, within a couple of seconds, you're able to really deliver the diagnosis also in a pre-hospital setting. Steve, any recommendations or Pendle, any recommendations on how 
to improve the detection of OMI in the pre-hospital setting? Kendall? I think it's pretty similar to, to the ED, you know, um, and so what the beauty of this is that you can use this on any phone right now. So there's really no reason why uh, hospital providers sh should, should have to do this diagnosis much differently. Um, so uh, the, the good news is that it can be applied everywhere. And we're, we have lots of pilot studies doing exactly that. So I'm really happy to say that the way this works should work for both. Yeah, I, I want to answer one comment here, could I? There's a comment here that says, uh, change the name of your seminar to advertisement. This is supposed to be healthcare content and improving patient outcomes, not marketing. And I realized that that's what it seems like here. There, I would tell you about any product that, that could improve the care of OMI patients. Um, I have spent my 35 years of my career doing this for no benefit at all. My blog has been free open access for 15 years. I've done it all to try to save lives. I've done, I've published 60 peer reviewed papers on the EKG and have never had any help financially do that. I've never gotten any funding for EKG studies. This has all been because I'm passionate about trying to de detect occlusion myocardial infarction and save people's lives. And I, I'm, yes, it is a product. And yes, I do have a financial interest in it, but uh, I, you know, I don't need a financial interest. I'm, I'm at the point of point in my career where I could easily retire. I have twice as much money as I need to retire. That's not why I'm doing this. This is something I believe in and something I've worked my entire career towards. So um, that's the answer to that question. And I think the uh, sort of also looking at the, the the entire scope of the of the of the problem, there is no way to uh, there is there is no way to really provide uh, accurate OMI diagnosis unless you use an AI approach. And obviously, there will be multiple solutions doing this in the future. But uh, I think it is really critical. Uh, to understand that you know AI is coming into healthcare, and AI is already changing a lot of lot of uh, different uh, aspects of healthcare, and it's just a second pair of eyes at uh, three a.m. in the morning. A couple more uh, OMI questions, maybe, and I think we can also wrap up soon. Um, there is roughly we're already ten minutes over over time, but there's there's still around five hundred uh, participants in the in the webinar. Uh, question about posterior uh, leads. Steve Pendle, I think this is discussed quite heavily yeah. on Twitter, uh, the uh, relevancy of posterior leads and uh, whether they're harmful or not. Uh, what do you think about? Um, I don't think they're particularly helpful. Uh, I don't think they're harmful if you understand how to use them. Uh, if patients have ST depression, maximal V1 to V4 in a setting, in a good pretest probability of, of ACS, and maximal V1 to V4 versus V5, V6, it's a posterior OMI. And with our study, which we published in the Journal of the American Heart Association two years ago, showed 97% specificity for OMI for that finding. I'm afraid if you, we didn't, people don't use posterior leads very often. And in that study, we didn't have hardly any patients who had posterior leads. So we can't say, what the sensitivity or specificity of posterior leads would have been, but it's hard to improve on 90%, 97% specificity. And I'm afraid that people that there's so little ST elevation on posterior leads that people are going to miss it. That's also at a different time. So by the time you put posterior leads on, sometimes the patient has reperfused and people don't notice. I've seen it many times where leads V1 to V3 remain on the anterior chest. And by the time they do the posterior ECG, that ST depression that was in V1 to V3 is gone because the artery is reperfused. And then they look at the posterior leads. And of course, there's no ST elevation in the posterior leads. And so they assume there's no ACS at all, that it was just a false positive. And it, what it was, was a reperfusion, not a false positive. Indeed, indeed. Uh, maybe a question about people starting to enter the, the OMI paradigm and, you know, uh, people starting off uh, of learning what there is to learn about this. And it's really, I would say, a very interesting time in this field and a lot of, a lot of revolution happening across, across the different subfields of ACS. Uh, what would be a 
particularly good place to start uh, to learn how to detect OMI on the ECGs, to learn the, the, the sort of data behind OMI. What do you think, uh, Pendle, Steve? Dr. Smith's ECG blog is the best place to learn. And let me show you, can I show something on, on Dr. Smith's ECG blog, which is an amazing little thing? Let me uh, let go me ahead. go to, let me share my screen. And we're gonna go to HQ Meta, Dr. Smith's ECG blog. If you go right here, OMI Pocket Guide. This was put together by a cardiology fellow who reads my blog, the OMI Guide, omiguide.org right there. And it had it's they he's taken all all the most representative cases of each of these things and put them in here like LBBB or V paste for SOMI, LVH for SOMI, LV annual for SOMI, and he he shows you uh, all these all the cases come from my blog Smith modified scar muscle and this is all linked to the full case at Dr Smith's ECG blog and and so you can really get a concentrated education using the OMI guide. I think a perfect website to definitely always keep on your phone uh, to also differentiate the mimics from from actual omis. Uh, maybe a question, and I I know that we're also working on this um, sort of, sort of to reveal this, but there were a couple of questions on actually uh, identifying criteria that it will not you know be as simple as the STEMI criteria but criteria that will help physicians in detecting OMI, and particularly for features like hyperacute T waves, terminal, terminal QRS distortions. I know, Pendle, you uh, you know a lot about this topic and you have a lot of ideas here. What are your thoughts for this quantification and uh, what should we really focus on here? Yeah, great idea. Uh, Steve and I love to do this. We've been doing it for 10 years. So we've done the ones that are doable by humans so far, right? So we, I personally measured thousands of ST segments and S waves in our left bundle validation study. That's because I was able to do that. I could measure them. And that's why how we were able to come up with a quanti quantified definition and study it. Things like hyperacute T waves are way harder uh, because it requires area. So we need, we need a computer to be able to do automated area under a curve. And then we can you can divide the area under the curve of the T wave divided by the QRS. That is Steve and I's guess of what the best number definition for hyperacute T waves will be. But so far, we haven't had anybody who's been able to um, autom automatically take all of our cases and and measure things like that. But now that we have more and more capabilities, I, I think we're going to get that capability very soon, probably within the next year. And I'm just itching to quantify hyperacute T waves and all kinds of other things. Then we can help explain to everybody what it is that's that's letting letting our experience be accurate at finding these things. If we could explain them, we can explain what the Queen of Hearts is doing and seeing. So all that will be coming as soon as we have the technology that lets us study it. Definitely. And here I would want to also maybe mention the fact that we are actually working on creating this large global uh, data set of ECGs and adjudicated outcomes. And uh, we have over 50 sites currently participating in these cohorts. And uh, I think these, these data sets will be crucial to really highlight the patterns that are mostly missed, the patterns that are associated with the highest mortality in, in, in patients with acute coronary occlusion or the specific uh, quantification of the specific features that are diagnostic for acute coronary occlusion. So definitely I invite anyone uh, of our listeners to reach out if they have already some ACS databases collected. Uh, there is a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, research being done is, in this field uh, and we can really use these, these data sets to sort of create a global representation of, of acute myocardial infarction and the ECG findings it can, uh, it can manifest as and uh, use this to answer these, these very important questions that are necessary to, uh, to shed light on the, on the features that are associated with acute coronary occlusion. So definitely reach out if, if this is something that your teams are working uh, on and if you have some data sets um, already, already collected. 
I just also want to say that this is uh, the first OMI webinar. So definitely give us feedback. And also after the webinar, feel free to reach out either on social media or uh, Twitter. I think that's, that's quite a popular one where we interact with many of you or even email and let us know what you thought about the webinar, uh, how we can improve and uh, any, any ideas for future iterations. Obviously and, uh... we are... Let me say, co collect some interesting cases that you have for one of our upcoming webinars where you can share it with us live and we will analyze the EKG and see if we, we get it right. And important here is to really have the adjudicated outcome or an entire data necessary to adjudicate the outcome. And, and we, need the we can also we, put... We need the angiogram, we need subsequent EKGs, all the troponin levels, the echocardiogram, if you have all that data and and you show and then we'll we'll analyze the EKG and see how it correlates with the outcome. Awesome. And we can also put the Queen of Hearts uh, to the test uh, to the test in in real time. Perfect. So I guess uh, there's still a lot of open questions. I think we will have access to the questions. And uh, if there are some things that we didn't cover. We will definitely make sure to cover it in the future webinars uh, and also be sure to address these in, in any blogs or uh, any further correspondence. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I think we we had over half of the participants actually staying on for the entire webinar. So I think it, it, it's, it's great uh, to see also uh, these numbers. Uh, it's really, really amazing to see how many uh, physicians, paramedics, uh, emergency physicians, cardiologists, and other healthcare professionals and nurses actually are interested in this topic, uh, have been following Dr. Smith's ECG blog, who's really been preaching uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I would say, gap uh, in the current management of, of, of chest pain patients. And maybe, Steve Pendle, any last words uh, from your end? Now just keep on learning and keep on helping patients. Yeah, thank you guys so much for continuing to send us cases and engaging with us on all the forms of, of uh, communication. Uh, a lot of those cases make it into training. So you guys literally are powering every time we do a version of training, we're better because of you guys. So we really appreciate it. Thank you very much and see you on the next one. Bye-bye.